Hi, it's time for another math easy solution. Uh, today we're going to discuss further into applications of integrals and look further into moments and centers of mass. And now we'll go over a very interesting theorem called the theorem of Pappus. Uh, basically, a surprising connection can be made between uh, centroids and volumes of revolution. Centroids, again, this is just another way of saying center of mass. Uh, basically, uh, yeah, we're going to look look at the theorem of Pappus, where we connect volumes and centers of mass. Basically, let R uh, be a plane region. Basically, the plane is just uh, on one x y coordinates or a 2D region that lies entirely on one side of a line L in the plane, and if R is rotated about L then the volume of the resulting solid is the product of the area A of the region R and the distance D traveled by the centroid of R. So in other words, if you let's say take a region such as, let's just draw a uh, region like this, let's draw a region. Let's say you take a region R, so this region across like that, and it's just a random shape, it's for a e simple shape to e easier to draw and it's entirely on one side of a line L in the plane so let's say we have a line L like this I'll, I'll draw it like this okay so this is the line L and let's say if this is R and let's say the centroid is somewhere here or we'll call that C I'll just put the C like that then the volume of the resulting solid when you rotate it about, so if R is rotated about L, so let's say you rotate it, you get a shape like this, and then you get something like, I'll just draw this, it's a bit hard to draw this neat. Yeah, let's just draw this in uh, red actually. So let's say something like this, and, and then we're rotating it, we get a shape that looks something like this. So this is not the scale, it's the, let's see, draw this a bit neater, 3D, we get some sort of shape like this, and then this is 3D, so we're just trying to draw it in 3D, and then this goes like that, okay. Yeah, so we get a shape that looks something like this. Yes, yeah, so we get a volume across this whole thing, and and again, this is about this line L. And the theorem states that the volume, so the volume of this entire shape V, is equal to the product of the area of the region of R, so A, of this region. So this whole thing, j just this section there, A, and the product of the distance traveled by the centroid of R when you rotate it. So in other words, let's say a centroid is there, and let's say you're rotating it all the way about this line, and uh, let's keep drawing it around. So the total distance across, uh, distance, or we'll call that D, all the way across this whole thing. So D right there. So the volume is um, it's a volume V, make it capital letters, equals the area of the region times by distance of the centroid travels around. And so yeah, that's a pretty interesting uh, theorem. And now we'll look at the proof of it. Okay, so now let's consider the special case in which the region lies between two curves and the line L is the y-axis. So similar to the earlier video I, I went over the formulas for centers of mass of a region that lies between two curves. So let's just draw this out. So let's say this is the y axis like this and this is the x axis, so x and y. So the region, let's just say the region is something like this. This is at y equals f of x and it, the intervals are from a to b and then it, the region is between two curves, so this is y equals fx, and this is y equals g of x. So what we end up having is this is our region R, so that's the region R. And the centroid, let's say centroid is somewhere over here, 
and we'll call this C, and has coordinates of X and Y with the line above, indicating it's the center of mass. And the method we'll use to solve this uh, volume is basically we'll recall the method of cylindrical shells that I went over in my earlier videos for finding volumes of when you revolve it around the y-axis, cylindrical shells. So method of cylindrical shells, if we're rotating this, yeah, rotating it about this y-axis like that, this whole shape, let's just take a random piece here. So the idea is again, you take a sub-interval, let's say this part right here, at x, yeah, at this point, let's say the point that we're sampling here is the center of that, and again, so this one right here at the center of this rectangle, we'll call this xi with a line above, so the center of that, and in fact, that is also the center of mass of this rectangle, just by symmetry. So, anyway, so then at this point right here, this is our xi, so we're, again, the idea is always take a sub-interval, and this is just a general one, so at this point right here is xi minus one. So in the center of it is the point that's gonna be touching these axes, I mean, touching these uh, curves. And then the idea is to rotate this and get a shell. So we would take this section, rotate this all the way about, let's say it's somewhere here. So we get something like that, and then this distance across here is delta x and we get a shape like that. Let's draw this down here and then rotate this about. Let's draw this a better rotation. So yeah, just the drawing is just a bit more tedious. So we draw it in 3D like that. So we get a shell that has thickness delta x Again, uh, make sure to watch my early video on this to get just more detail here. And then rotate this all the way about. So let me draw this a bit one more time neater. Okay. So we get a shell that looks like that. And draw this in 3D. Okay, so when we rotate this, this section of this region, we get a shape like this. And let's call this and then this total distance across here, this height of this is simply gonna be, well, that's just the top curve minus the bottom curve at the center point there, minus g of x, i, like that. Yeah, and the radius of this shell, that's simply gonna be, that's gonna be from here all the way to here, which is simply x i. Um, with the line above. So this is xi like that. So for this region we have a volume of vi and then again like always we would sum this up to infinity. Yes yeah, so now the volume of this shell or this subsection is going to be like I explained before it's going to be well the circumference just a, of a shell and I proved this in the video of method of cylindrical shells proof so make sure to watch that circumference times it by the the height and then times it by the thickness in this case our circumference is going to be 2 pi and then the radius which is xi like that so this is our radius right there of this sub subsection. And then the height is gonna be right here. That's this right here, that's our height. Well, I'll just write equals height. Times it by f of x i minus, minus g of x i. So that's the difference from this whole thing. Yeah, so that's pretty much the difference between these two curves and then times it by the thickness, which is, well, delta x, like that. So that is the thickness of this subsection right here. So, like always, we would, 
uh, sum this up to uh, basically infinite infinite number of these subsections that are infinitely small so that this xi center line becomes coincides with this xi and xi minus 1 and simply become just call it x because it's the same uh, point when you go take the limit to infinity and again make sure to watch that in the video link below and then what we end up getting is just the integral we get the total volume is going to be the summation or the limit from a to b of now like I explained 2 pi x and then f of x minus g of x and then times it by dx which is the infinitely small section uh, infinitely small thickness delta x like that and again make sure to watch the proof video for this to get that so now that we have this right here yeah, this is the volume of that uh, just a general shape above here. That's the region between these two curves, and you get a volume when you rotate uh, the whole thing around. So that's the volume. But now what's interesting is, well, if we recall the centers of mass formula. So the formulas for centers of mass that I showed earlier for a region bounded by two curves. So formulas for centers of mass. So if we recall this, and for the x-coordinate, that's all we need for this case. Recall it for the x-coordinate, we I show that it's equal to 1 over a, or the area of the region from a to b. And you can see the proof of this in my earlier video. So this is going to be f of x minus g of x dx like that. So that's the centroid or center of mass in the x-coordinate. As you can see, this is the exact same. This has this exact same part right here this x times f of x minus g of x and again where a is equal to the area of the region r area of I'll call it of region r and which equals to simply the integral from a to b of this is going to be integral from a to b of f of x minus g of x dx yeah, and that's just the area of that region. I was write this a bit neater. So a to b, write this like that. Yeah, like I don't know why I wasn't writing it neat, but uh, anyway. So now what we have here, if we rearrange this and solve just for this x times f of x minus g of x, what we end up getting is we'll have x the center of mass times by the area is equal to a b x f of x minus g of x d of x. So we have this part and then we, then we could just take this constant out to pi when we end up getting is this part right here. So we could throw this x times a inside this part right here. So what we end up getting is volume is equal to 2 pi and then just replace this whole thing with x and a. This whole, this whole thing. So it's going to be equal to times it by the centroid times a. And now just write this, uh, just, in, just like this, make the brackets 2 pi and x like here, times by a, just move this brackets around, doesn't change anything. So what we end up getting is, well, this 2 pi times the centroid, that's the circumference, times it by this a. So this right here is the circumference. Uh, it's a circumference of a circle that's uh, basically the point yeah, about where the radius is the centroid. In other words, if we call this D, so where, yes, yeah, so if we let that equal to do so, V equals to, we'll put A times D, where, where basically a area is the region, and again, D is the, where D equals to 2 pi x here, and again, it's the circumference, or you could also say it's the distance traveled. Yeah, it's the distance traveled by the centroid. And then we just proved our uh, theorem above. By the, yeah, the centroid about the y-axis in our case. The general one is just any line. In our case, we just proved for the y-axis, which is quite uh, amazing, actually. Let's go back up here. And again, so this is the distance traveled by the centroid, is d, 
and and that is our D right here. So we just basically solved it for this special case of the region bounded between two curves. Yeah, so that's pretty remarkable actually how it's you could just solve for the full volume just by finding the area and the distance traveled by the centroid, which is pretty cool. Yeah, now I just want to go over a brief history lesson because it's uh, just pretty interesting. Uh, basically, the th on the theorem of Pappus. So the theorem of Pappus is named after the Greek mathematician Pappus of Alexandria, who lived in the fourth century A.D. Basically, he lived from the year 290 to 350 A.D. and is yeah one of the last great uh, Greek mathematicians of antiquity. I think it's just. Old, olden time uh, Greek mathematicians. Uh, and basically, or uh, I mean the Greek of old as opposed to uh, nowadays. But, uh, but outside of his own writings and mathematical theorems, very little is known about his life besides that he has a son, Hermodorus. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing Papus right or Papus. But, anyways, and he was also a teacher at Alexandria. And again, again Alexandria is in Egypt. Uh, if you didn't know. Yeah, so there wasn't much known of his own life besides his theorems and that he had a son and he was a teacher. And basically, but what was interesting about him is Pappus flourished at a time where there was a general stagnation in mathematical science where he stands out as a remarkable exception. And his writings, in fact, were far beyond the uh, understanding of his own contemporaries, which, uh, which is shown through very little references to his works during his time. So it wasn't until after later on when people realized he had a, a lot of good ideas and theorems. And another important uh, theorem of Pappus is his hexagon theorem. I'm not going to go over that right now. And uh, basically I also pointed out Pappus theorem or the theorem of Pappus may refer to his hexagon theorem or his centroid theorem which is the one I just uh, covered in this video. Anyways that's all for today. I hope you learned um, a little thing about well, Pappus' uh, brief history of his, and also uh, this pretty inter interesting theorem and its proof. Anyways, that's all for today. If you learn, like always, you can download these exact notes in the link below. And thanks for watching, and stay tuned for another math easy 